Здравствуйте все. Тогда начинаем. Сегодня... The press conference is dedicated to the setting, to the kind of conditions that people are forced to operate in. Our speakers of the day are Marina Zoltova, Tut Biwai. Marina, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Pavel Sverdlov, Euroradio. We have Pavel Sverdlov from Euroradio. Pavel, hello. Pyotr Kuznetsov, Sydney Novosti, Gomel. And Viktor Marchuk, the Brest newspaper. Viktor, good afternoon. Right, you're there. Brest. Okay, so dear participants, just a reminder, you can type your questions into the chat box, in which case I will voice them. Alternatively, you can also ask to be past the floor in this very chat. So we will enable your camera and microphone you will be able to voice your question live yourself. And just a reminder that we have simultaneous interpretation available. Should you want that, please hit the globe icon below and select uh, the Russian or the English track if uh, you prefer English. Just one more request, the usual one. Please, dear participants, uh, could you rename yourselves uh, to match the following format? La name, last name, and your media outlet, your media agency. In that case, it will be clearer to us who is asking the question when we relate them to the speakers. Okay, so that's it for the technical part. Uh, let's begin. Dear speakers, uh, have you been notified that uh, there's going to be some introductory address that you will be uh, encouraged to speak with? To, to, to start with. Okay, in that case, if you have been, uh, Marina, the floor is yours. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Once again, I haven't really prepared an introductory uh, address or statement. The situation is changing day in, day out, but everything that's happening uh, to the media is, is only going worse. The Narodna Volia, the People's Will newspaper, Yesterday, well, it's happening today. Yesterday, there was the decision against Helena Grzelovich uh, of the so-called court. So this is the most troubling news for me, because it essentially means that any one of us, any of the colleagues, any of the guys that work uh, at uh, campaigns, rallies, uh, they can get a visit to their homes, uh, take a trip to the police department and to our Christina the detention center. And there will be a so-called court that will award them the sentence of 15 days imprisonment. If back in the day, you remember how the situation used to develop. In summer, there were cases of mass detentions of journalists. They were taken to the police departments uh, to uh, identify them. Now there are cases and there are still going on. This is still going on when people are detained uh, at rallies or uh, near rallies uh, and they are being put to court because uh, they were there or because they did not comply with the lawful requirements of the law enforcement staff. And people are also given prison in short term imprisonments. Now we have the law enforcement uh, going to people's homes. This basically puts our work into some insane conditions. I don't really remember anything of the kind happening throughout our history, when we essentially cannot do our job uh, the way we should. I'm not even saying legally, because in principle everything that we are doing is legal, is legitimate. But using the word legal and law and legitimacy, is, is, it's useless when the law is not working when the laws are not working. This is the only thing that you can basically conclude about. Uh, but still, nonetheless, in these conditions, uh, we will continue working. How do we stop the lawlessness? Well, I only believe that uh, that's only possible when the government changes, when the new government is in. With further escalation of violence, 
with further aggressive behavior on the part of the security forces, law enforcement, we understand that a more humane treatment neither to people at large nor to journalists in particular are to be expected. Nothing like that is going to happen. So our moods are, how do I put this? We are aware of all this. At the same time, we keep our hopes high. We are not giving up. We continue working. And this situation is not just alarming. It's it's completely troublesome. It's it's it bothers completely. Radio. Pavel Sirlov, your radio. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I didn't really prepare an introductory statement either. Everything that Marina has said, I second that. It's all fair. Indeed, any journalist can receive a visit to the home from the police. Uh, they can get an accusation that uh, they didn't, they were not there doing their job at the rally, but they were, they were actually participating. And they will be detained and uh, put into prison for 15 days. Just one more thing about the court uh, today. Uh, this journalist, freelancer, and amateur photographer Katerina Medvedeva is at court, is in court. Uh, she was detained at the March of People with Disabilities. So it essentially, it's just a person with a professional camera who came there to take pictures of, of uh, what's going on that, that very March. Katerina does not cooperate with any media outlets. Uh, she simply sends her photographs to us and to other outlets uh, via Telegram. So this is the user-generated user content. This is the UGC that we've been hoping for because the journalists have been deprived of the right to do their job at mass events. The journalists are no longer protected because, well, they do have the credentials, but these editorial, these credentials from the editor's office, they don't, don't mean anything for the law enforcement and for the courts. That is, the government is taking every step, is taking steps to intimidate, to curtail, to, the freedoms of people who are doing or making making content for us and close up even that opportunity to bring light to the mass events. Alias Lubinchuk, the Belsat uh, case can also be recalled here. He was imprisoned at the hotel or he was detained in the hotel room. They did a very correct judgment where he's supposed to be. They rented the room, so he was supposed to be safe. And they booked him a hotel room to, with, a, with a good uh, view overlooking the events. But it so happened that uh, he got a knock on the door. He believed that uh, the, those were the employees of the hotel, but uh, these, were the, the, these were law enforcement. He was also, uh, he, he was also uh, found guilty of participating in the rally. The anonymous uh, witnesses trumped up charges, the, the usual deal. And basically, they uh, suggested uh, that he, he was there in the rally, although he was several dozens of meters away in a building in, in his hotel room. Nonetheless, he was arrested and uh, he served the 15-day sentence. So this is th these are the two cases I wanted to bring your attention to. Thank you, Pavel. Pyotr Kuznetsov, I see that uh, I saw that Yulia raised her hand. I didn't really know what that meant. Well, uh, maybe I would like to ask uh, a question. Pavel, you never mentioned the accreditation bit. So all the people have been deprived uh, of the accreditation. What about the uh, correspondence point? OK, so a few words. Euronews operates uh, as the foreign media. Our head office is in Poland. And uh, in early October, every employee that was accredited, they lost the accreditation. Uh, the formal reason was uh, the Ministry of, the, uh, of Foreign Affairs uh, adopted new rules uh, for accreditation, and they wanted to re-accredit all the journalists. We filed applications, uh, and uh, we were, uh, our employees were supposed to get temporary accreditations for, uh, within five days and permanent within 30 days. Uh, five days on, we received the notifications that there is a huge line, we're not coping, uh, so we will consider your applications longer. 
So they're being considered uh, still. The same is uh, true for the uh, applications for the requests uh, for uh, permanent, permanent accreditation. Our correspondence station was accredited. Well, the Council of Ministers uh, makes a decision on that. And the day before yesterday, the correspondence station is uh, no longer technically accredited. Every year they, they extend this uh, accreditation, but right now it's, it's not happening. So we don't have a paper telling us to stop uh, the correspondence station uh, operation, uh, nor uh, a paper that we have been extended for another year. We, we can stay in Minsk for another year and support the correspondence station's operation. So this is the suspended situation, the same that the, the, the journalists are experiencing. Today we had a call from the tax authorities, and they are, and we get a question from them: Are you guys allowed to uh, continue your operation? Well, we responded: uh, You should, you, you guys should call the Council of Ministers, and they will tell you. So this is the kind of suspended situation we're in, and possibly the new uh, certificates or the new credentials uh, that the. Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, issue or are about to issue, they're a kind of an indulgence uh, to work at rallies. The Sputnik uh, people uh, who are also detained at the Israelis, uh, they are freed without any protocols, without any violations being recorded uh, from the police departments. Belarusian journalists uh, with Belarusian accreditations are not uh, set free. They are uh, written up and basically imprisoned for 15 days or, or less. Thank you, Pavel. I'd like to pass the floor to Piotr Kuznetsov. Piotr, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon once again. Well, indeed, I've never really prepared an introductory statement. I would just uh, reiterate and basically say anything, uh, say, say everything that any journalist out there can say. Uh, Right now, the media in Belarus operates in complete, uh, in the setting of complete lawlessness. Uh, the legal frameworks have all been discarded and thrown away and destroyed. Uh, we've been facing this quite intensely in our activities for over a month. Uh, since October the 2nd, uh, our employees, our staff members uh, started to get det detained. Uh, there were searches uh, in the office. Uh, so. Maybe we've had one week arrest free. We've lived one week uh, arrest free. But other than that week, uh, well, people were detained. They were taken for questioning, taken in for questioning, and so on and so forth. So just one week uh, during the month when we could work more or less fine. It's, it's, it's a disaster. It's a disaster for the working process, for the workload. Well, I consider these things and I construe these things this way. Uh, the journalists and the media are little different uh, from rank and file people, from ordinary Belarusians that take to the streets. Because check this out our editors, uh, editor in chief, uh, got a visit home that yes the day before yesterday roman the, the guy was was killed uh, in, the, in the backyard of, of his own home mm, he was beaten to death and he lately and he, and he died yesterday so the authorities discard any law possible and they do not give the satisfaction to anyone they hold as enemies uh, they definitely believe the independent media to be enemies uh, it's obvious that they will that they will have uh, done away with us uh, in any means possible, by any means possible. But if the media is, is uh, destroyed, the, the Telegram channels will overtake this role and uh, they will create an even more information, noise and chaos than the media otherwise would have. So I, I'm not particularly optimistic in this situation, but our moods are, well, oh, we have really uh, discussed this at length and we've uh, reached a simple conclusion. This is our job. That's our job. And uh, the only option here is to, to stop doing our job or to keep doing it. So we intend to keep doing it and we, uh, we plan to carry, out, carry on like that.
Uh, apologies. Uh, may I elaborate uh, briefly on the on Piotr's words? Because indeed, I wanted to highlight this uh, point. In the regions outside of Minsk, uh, the situation is even more challenging for the journalists. Because if we're talking about rallies in Minsk, well, not all journalists, they, they don't know every journalist uh, by face. They don't know the faces. Uh, the journalists can mingle with the crowds. Uh, in, in, in the regions, it's impossible. Well, first of all, because uh, they know all the journalists uh, out there, the rallies are not gathering too many people exactly for that reason because uh, these uh, rallies were scattered away by severe reprisals and the people in the regions, the journalists in the regions are much more vulnerable than in Minsk, although uh, you would see, uh, well, in Minsk at least we have some degree of protection, in the regions they're not, they don't, they're not protected. Okay, Breska uh, Gazeta, Viktor Marchuk, the floor is yours. Well, unlike my colleagues, I've uh, found some time and I've prepared something since of today's speakers. I'm the only person uh, or the, the only uh, journalist uh, uh, that prints uh, hard copies of the paper, not just online. I would just like to show uh, the front page of Brest's newspaper, Brestka Gazeta, uh, they reflect the dynamics we're in. I will enable my screen sharing and you'll be able to comment uh, on the pictures I've prepared. These are the pictures, right? Belarus after elections. So this is the first, the front page of our issue. Uh, that uh, saw the light of day on the 10th of August, the next day after the elections. I can really say that the open season against journalists, at least in Brest, started from the very first days of mass protests, mass campaigns. This picture is belongs to Sergei Nikrashevich, our out-of-staff uh, correspondent, on August the 11th, uh, himself and the Tutbai correspondent Stas Korshunov uh, were detained, were detained very brutally. The right police, the Amon, took them to the backyard. They beat them on the legs, uh, on the buttocks, uh, then they put uh, put them on, on the minibus and uh, took the took them to the temporary detention center. This is the next uh, edition, the front page again. After these severe crackdowns, reprisals of the first days, well, for the justice sake, uh, the, we need to state that there was a, a, a bit of a quell afterwards. This is the large square in Brest. There was a mass rally. Well, you can see the number of people. The, the square is full. This is the next Sunday, uh, the next rally. So we've put uh, this picture because there are two flags, uh, the current uh, official on the right and the white, red, white on the left. This picture was given to us uh, by Stas Korshunov, the uh, Tutbai correspondent who was released from the uh, t -t temporary detention center by then. This is another edition, Anneritsko's poster, Pray for Belarus, the images of today. Last year, Brest celebrated uh, 1000th anniversary. So she was one of the authors of the local for the celebration of this 1000 years anniversary of the city. Uh, we also had uh, pictures or posters of her uh, in the middle of the edition. The next uh, edition, the next issue was uh, dedicated to journalists alone. Uh, this is the front page, Journalists of the March. This is the full page. We have introduced all the 
journalists that uh, represented independent media and that worked uh, that worked uh, on the uh, at rallies. Uh, Marina said that uh, the regions are having it worse than Minsk. Uh, Brest is a larger city compared to others, but there are not too many journalists. So this double page spread basically features uh, people, you know, the journalists, uh, virtually all of whom have been either imprisoned or put, in, uh, put up for temporary detention. And this is the first edition dedicated to the Pensioners March, uh, the, the first uh, event of the kind happened in Minsk. And one week after, uh, the Brest pensioners, Brest, Brest senior citizens also took to the streets. I wanted to highlight this picture. There was a photo exhibition in Brest. And the curator of uh, the the curator of that exhibition said that in the current situation, the Belarusian women, women rule, the rock basically okay th these are our our currently out of staff uh, journalists uh, they spent three days of detention at the temporary detention center uh, then there was a court uh, you can see the the house of justice uh, the letters in, in the background Maria Karesnikova, uh, we uh, sent her uh, an edition. We uh, had her as our subscriber. We, do, we gave her one issue. And uh, she also said that uh, Brest people, you rock. She sent this picture of heart uh, to us uh, as a response to our gift. Uh, so these are the people uh, who have also been subjected to detentions and imprisonment. Yelena Gnauk is a senior citizen who is well known in Minsk, uh, well known in Brest, I mean. Uh, she spent several uh, s sentences, 10 days, 15 days imprisonment. As a young girl uh, at the top of the front page, uh, who is also the temporary detention unit uh, center, uh, she's uh, facing criminal charges. Uh, didn't quite catch uh, the accusation against her. Uh, this this was the first case uh, when the water cannon was used in Belarus uh, for to, to to scatter the crowd. This is the last front front page. I would like to show here. This is our uh, colleague, uh, issuing editor of the uh, church newspaper Tarkva. Uh, he served two 15-day statements, uh, 30 days in total. And there's a person above, a Brest citizen, Andrei Pristavko, who was imprisoned for five times. He also came to our editor's office. Uh, we talked to him. He's a programmer, software engineer. He's a great guy. But uh, the times today are such that, uh, well, people are hunted again. Well, people are hunted and journalists are hunted too. For Igor Varanovsky, this, this person's detention. I can tell you what the witnesses said. Uh, the police uh, chief uh, simply pointed at his uh, pointed at him with his finger, and uh, they took him in. So basically, yeah, open season against the journalists. That's it. All right. So just a reminder to our participants uh, that uh, you can. Type your questions into the chat box. Uh, Yulia, you wanted to take the floor. Yes, I would like to voice a few scary uh, figures here about what's actually happening to journalists these days. So uh, these figures, uh, this uh, statistics uh, is uh, true for the day before yesterday. Now they've gotten even worse, but I haven't had the time today to update them. So. 333 journalists detained as of the day before yesterday, 60 cases of physical violence, three wounds, three in, and uh, more than 700 days of arrest in total. Uh, the independent media journalists uh, have been awarded uh, today, uh, to, as of the day before yesterday. 
I don't think that there are people from the Belarusian Association of Journalists uh, attending today, but uh, these these figures come from their spreadsheet, come from, come, come from their statistical table. Maybe we should also add that right now 17 people are uh, in detention, held, held in detention. Yes, as we speak, 17 journalists are serving sentence, uh, and I believe that uh, the People's Will newspaper, uh, the, the full uh, circulation was arrested. Marina Koktesh, is she there? Is she there? I cannot really see her. Okay, I'll just uh, I'll ask whether she's joining us. If I may, I would ask a question to our speakers, and I would really encourage uh, everyone to answer it, every single one of them. So in these conditions, what is happening to the circulations, if we're talking about uh, published uh, newspapers, or with audiences, if it's an online media with, without any hard copies. So could you please uh, take turns to answer that question, starting, if possible, with Viktor Marchuk. So have your forms of interaction with the audience uh, transformed? Have, have they changed? Uh, is there more uh, tight contact? Uh, what's happening to the circulations? Well, the circulation that we're printing, it's, it's growing. It's uh, not really picking up quickly, or the numbers are not rising quickly, but it's growing. Uh, first of all, two, fact, two factors at play. First of all, the seasonality. This has always been the case uh, to paper versions. Uh, in the fall, when people are coming back from their vacations and there's, there's no more work to be done at the summer houses at Dutchess, they display more interest or higher interest uh, to hard copy to the paper version of the newspaper. But that's also related to the fact that uh, people want to know and what to read about the truth. Since we're the only newspaper in Brest that actually reflects uh, the events objectively, uh, events in the city, events in the country. I believe that this is the way, uh, or this is, this is the reason for people uh, displaying higher interest in, uh, in what we're doing. Uh, so November is in, mid-November. We used to have 25% of subscribers, now we have 27% uh, of subscribers. Uh, which uh, this small increase is, uh, is a reason for, uh, to rejoice for us. As for the website, I cannot really say that uh, we're seeing any spikes, mm, but we are facing some issues with the website. I believe that in particular, the, uh, these issues have something to do with the intervention by the government. At some point, uh, sometimes the internet is being slowed down or shut down completely. So to, I don't really know what's going on, but they, they do stuff to the internet, definitely. That's a bad thing. That's not uh, definitely not contributing to higher clicks, higher number of visitors to the, to the website. But as a response uh, to the government action, We've created a Telegram channel with uh, over a thousand subscribers. Uh, that might seem like a, a low number compared to others, but yet again, this this is a reason to rejoice for us because uh, it's, it took us two months uh, to get uh, our subscribers uh, to four digits. It's a good thing, I guess. And uh, as for the editor's office, maybe we'll talk about that at the later stage about the people, about the staff. Yeah, that, that was uh, supposed to be my second question. Let's. Uh... Oh, okay, for the audiences, I believe that, yeah, that would be my answer to your question. Okay, who'd like to be the next? For this, Piotr, perhaps you? What's, what's up? Well, I saw Pavel enable his mic. Okay, Pavel. Well, Pavel enabled and disabled his microphone. Yeah, of course, I, I can say a few words. Yeah, what's going on? As of uh, August the 9th, uh, our website has been blocked. We've made a mirror version. And we have felt a serious slump, not in August, but in September. I mean, in August, uh, people were prepared to use proxies. Uh, in September, there was a richer choice. They've been looking around. However, some traffic sources uh, Yandex Zen that you, we used to badmouth every single one of us. 
uh, these sources uh, make up for these slumps, make up for these losses. For some reason, the website block is bypassed if people access us uh, through Yandex Zen. So, yes, indeed, there are people uh, in our website, although we've lost uh, pretty much of the search traffic because of the block and uh, part of the traffic from the uh, originating from the social media pages. What have we done? We've uh, gone to social media 100%, uh, YouTube, Telegram, uh, social platforms, social media like Facebook, YouTube quadrupled, uh, Telegram 8x increase uh, or, so, or something something like that. This basically enables us to stay in touch with our audience uh, and uh, to rapidly communicate everything we feel like until such time that YouTube and the social media are blocked, although you have seen that Telegram was also sluggish uh, during mass rallies. YouTube was blocked uh, initially uh, early on after the elections uh, along with the rest of the stuff. So there are some steps that the governments are doing. There is some progress, quote unquote, uh, progress or lack thereof, rather. But yes, yeah, so far, these social media are operating. Thank you. Okay, I can uh, cite a few numbers, a few figures myself. August was record breaking uh, compared to, say, uh, Good figures, good stats of late 2019. The viewership, uh, the, uh, the clicks uh, to the web pages, the views of web pages were twice more in August. Then September, October, there was a certain, a certain reduction, certain slump. Although compared to other periods, compared, compared to other time frames, uh, these uh, figures were still higher than our uh, normal. Uh, stats, statistics. The biggest breakthrough, the biggest success was the two directions, social media and video content. Social media, the main one is Telegram, because back in May we had some 50,000 subscribers of our primary channel on Telegram. Now we have much more than that. Uh, I haven't uh, uh, haven't had a look at that for a while now. Haven't been looking at that for a while. Telegram is also giving us the most redirections uh, from social media. Compared to other, uh, yeah, more than 440,000 uh, subscribers uh, to, to BY. Uh, so Facebook, Instagram redirects to our pages. YouTube uh, quite recently we have launched uh, a channel to buy politics uh, in summer. We got the silver button pretty quickly, 100,000 subscribers, uh, that's uh, silver button. I cannot really say how many millions of views, uh, YouTube views we have per month. However, compared to the main channel, uh, Tude by Politics is uh, trending much uh, much uh, stronger, uh, 3x, 4x more views than the ma mainstream channel, uh, Tude by. Piotr, uh, yeah. Let me just say, uh, first of all, we have a fairly stable uh, audience uh, by the number of readers, because again, unlike many uh, representatives of the media here were not on Yandex Zen that Pavel has mentioned. So the numbers of audience uh, are not really shaking in our case, and not, not going up or down. We have around 800,000 unique users uh, per month. Before these events, now we have 1.1 million over August, September. We've, we've had a 300,000 increase. Uh, the, number of readers from uh, Gomel, from our city, uh, went up from 300,000 to 340,000. The number of views has gone up maybe by 70%. I mean, the number of unique visitors has not gone up, but the number of views has. I mean, people, uh, individual visitors read more than before. 
uh, YouTube doubled, Telegram doubled, both social media went up uh, from 10,000 to 20,000 subscribers. Our Telegram is 25,000, definitely not half a million, almost half a million like to, to be why, but it's the biggest of the regional media uh, to, be, to the best of my knowledge. The regional media, fortunately or unfortunately, they cannot get uh, this much viewership as the national uh, nation nationwide media like Belsat or F Freedom Radio because the attention of the country is uh, focused on the central rallies, central protests, central streams. After the so-called elections, uh, there were protests uh, pretty much everywhere across the country. Gomel, Oblast, uh, Belarusian met uh, met uh, metals factory or met metallic factory. Uh, well, we did the streams and our viewership was increasing. Right now, we are seeing a reduction of or plus, but, but it's still 20% higher than normal. Not plus 70 as it used to be at the, at the peak of the events, but uh, something 20% up compared to uh, the previous periods. Communication with the audience. When we had pressure against us, we saw a lot of loyalty from our, from our audience. Uh, Gomel people, this is our people, uh, for 10 years we've been together. When we had the toughest time, uh, well, three people were detained, uh, three people had to be hidden with the equipment. And when when the people saw that we are short-staffed, uh, we needed to, uh, to stay, uh, we needed to hire people, we needed to hire it to, to, to get equipment. We uh, launched the fundraising campaign and we were completely shocked by, by the positive outcome by the amazing result that we got, especially by the people who left their comments, uh, who made money transfers uh, and, and, and said in accompanying messages that we, you've always been doing everything for us, and now it's time for us to do everything for you. So yeah, it's a big upside. We start feeling each other, understanding each other, feeling closer to each other with our audiences. Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, Let's uh, take these questions a bit later. Yes, yeah, just I'm looking at the time. We, we only have 20 minutes remaining. Uh, oh, okay, user loyalty, uh, audience loyalty. There's a, there's a topic that needs to be uh, clarified. Uh, well, we made a mistake. I was supposed to be introduced as a co-moderator of this conference. Uh, I'm Yulia Slutska. I'm the founder of Press Club Belarus. I wanted to ask uh, Marina about uh, audience loyalty. I saw that you've uh, run an ad uh, on Telegram and on your website. When people physically, your audience can actually advertise. If there is nothing to advertise, they can advertise any social project. And I've seen you uh, launch it through Telegram. It's a very, it's a very important, important thing that first of all helps monetize this very uh, loyalty. It helps the media to stay afloat. At the same time, the people are given the opportunity to support you. So has this has this panned out? Uh, can you? Well, at at this point, I'm unable to answer this question because we've recently, we've only recently launched this initiative. But I can pull up the uh, facts and I can uh, write you back on that. Well, this is uh, probably the only legal way to get support uh, from rank and file readers, readership because there are some limitations, there are some constraints. I mean, we are not eligible as a media to get money from anyone. Essentially, this is how we do it. People uh, run advertisements, uh, they pay for social campaigns uh, to support uh, ad campaigns, to support some social projects, uh, and we get part of the ad money. We 
It's just that the situation that we've been experiencing, people kept uh, offering their assistance. Uh, please tell us what can we do for you, what, uh, how we how we can help. And we uh, saw the way out of the situation, we, we saw this campaign as uh, the way to give people this opportunity and to monetize the support. Uh, the outcomes, well, I'll, I'll provide you feedback by tonight. Okay. Okay, Anton, the floor is yours. Uh, question from uh, Media Tower, Mark Beckerman. What measures could and should the West take to stop this repression and protect journalists uh, from the repressions? Anyone? Well, it's it's an open question to anyone. So, any speaker. Right, let me start then. I believe that Euro Radio has been operating in Belarus uh, for so long, exclusively owing to the fact that at the high diplomatic level there were negotiations, there was uh, discussion, there was work done with various Belarusian institutions and authorities to say that the media must operate freely must be or, uh, foreign journalists must, must be granted the right to work in belarus uh, this was explained for years postulated for years uh, this is how or th th this is why we felt protected right now all of this work i'm not really saying that uh, it's uh, wasted uh, but it's clear that uh, the Belarusian authorities, uh, uh, they don't care about the image. They, they simply want to stay in place. They don't care how many foreign journalists operate in the country. Whether somebody abroad believes or every, everyone believes uh, that the press operates freely in Belarus or quite the contrary, there is authoritarian, totalitarian state that prevents that. This uh, soft diplomacy measures in this situation cannot work, they cannot bring any constructive results. This means that, uh, as painful as it is for me to say this, the, my attitude, my take on the sanctions is 50-50. On the one hand, I, I understand the political importance and significance. On the other hand, I understand that they can also impair uh, the living standards of rank-and-file Belarusians, because Who's going to be uh, deprived of the money? Who, whose money will be pocketed for the government to fund themselves when, when the government is sanctioned? Uh, they will pocket the money from everyone, uh, everyone's money uh, that they can get their hands on. Uh, us, the businesses, and when these sources uh, are out, uh, they will start with rank and file Belarusians, ordinary people. So in this case, I need to state that uh, aside from serious pressure, economic pressure, uh, there's really uh, no other ways that the West uh, can do uh, or can uh, improve the situation. This is my opinion. Piotr, Viktor, Marina. Well, just as a contemplation, uh, we see that the statements, uh, requests, uh, public publicly uh, disseminated by Western diplomats, officials, the public, uh, the government uh, either uh, is, uh, they're indifferent to that or they're irritated by that. Two more things, uh, the two, two things that are important, that I find important. First of all, uh, the Belarusian agenda must not be forgotten. Because, guys, everything that's happening here in Belarus is, is, is a nightmare, it's horror, it's horrible. The extent of violence, lawlessness that we see happening in the country these days, I simply cannot take this uh, calmly. And I believe it's important for the global community to not forget about Belarus. Because I do understand what... Uh, Belarus is with a population of nine and a half million when the US elections on Nagorno Karabakh events and there's, there's so many other events uh, coronavirus uh, 
Belarus is living through a very horrible drama. So Belarus should not vanish from the international agenda, international news agenda. I believe that the West uh, can act as an intermediary, or at least uh, tries to act as a mediator, as an intermediary between Lukashenko and the public. Well, I don't really know with Kremlin on board, without Kremlin on board, well, in any other way possible. Uh, this is important to keep these attempts going because the situation is critical and this is this is true. Thank you, Viktor, Piotr, you'd like to elaborate, Piotr? Right, so actually, I believe that currently this is a paradoxical situation. The West either does not have any tools to improve the situation for Belarusians and for the journalists, or it has one tool that must not be resorted to in, in, any, in any event. Well, the, situ the situation could have improved now if uh, the West started talking to Lukashenko as they, as they should have. Uh, it's, uh, this is to uh, say that uh, some things can be uh, resolved diplomatically, as Pavel has mentioned, as, as these things have been, uh, were being resolved until now. Uh, now Lukashenko is uh, really torrential. I mean, he's... Uh, he cannot go to, to, the, to the West, and he, he, he cannot trust the West. He does not have the space for maneuver. At the same time, he believes and he understands that nobody will intervene, intervene or interfere here by force. He understands that he can do to the people everything he pleases, because all the bridges have been burned, and the situation is not going to get worse for him. He must stay in power, he believes, and, and then do the damage control. So th this is what he proceeds from. And in this case, I don't even separate Belarusians, uh, uh, journalists from the Belarusians. It's nine and a half million people that you mentioned, and these are hostages. And the West, I fully second what Marina has said. Uh, Belarus should not be uh, disappearing from the news agenda, from the agenda in, all in all. Solidarity must be expressed, but in very careful terms, very carefully, because we even see by the outcome of the Armenian, uh, Armenian Azeri war in Nagorno Karabakh, Armenia, the ally of, of Russia, uh, seems to be the loser, but uh, Russia seems to have gained, seems to have strengthened, strengthened its position uh, by uh, contributing the peacekeeping force. So, in this case, yeah, we need to be careful with the situation. Victor, you wanted to elaborate? Yes, I will second what my colleagues have just said in that respect. Despite other important events, crucial events happening in the world, uh, Belarus must not vanish uh, from the global agenda, because if this does happen, we will have an easy, uh, we will have an even harder time. It might seem that, that there's no way it can get worse, but I do believe that well, we're not, we have not reached the bottom. The bottom is still to be reached. I believe that uh, the words by Maria Lekaresnikova uh, could be fitting for the situation. She spoke them before the elections uh, when she recalled uh, about uh, the current regime. We'll need to bang them on the heads, uh, keep banging on their heads, politically, diplomatically, on the economic front, on all the fronts. Again, I will agree with Piotr, uh, we need to tread lightly, because if we overdo this, there will be a lot of recoil. Yes, indeed. Lukashenko has gone to Ranchel. His There's no way of stopping him. Uh, if he, he, won't, he won't be stopped. But uh, overdoing it, uh, overdoing with this uh, struggle, can make things worse, but some pressure, some some begging uh, still needs to continue and things might improve. I'm not sure of that, but now there is a direct war. Yeah, without explosions like in Nagorno-Karabakh, but yeah, the war is on. What it will result in is difficult to say at this point. Yulia? 
Yes, I also had a question to all the speakers of the day. Uh, the journalists operate in insane conditions because this whole political madness, uh, this, this uh, also pandemic uh, going on, uh, that's curtailing our opportunities significantly. For three months, uh, no decent rest. I'm not even thinking back to, to the time before the elections because it was not e it was, it was not uh, an easy time either. Uh, can you tell uh, what's happening at your editor's offices? Uh, what's uh, happening? Remote work or you work together? What's the, what's the atmosphere? How do you keep it going within the editor's office? Can you try answering this uh, question that might seem stupid, but what can be done to help you to, to keep that atmosphere going? So what would make uh, your life, your work uh, in the editorial offices easier? Say you have a magic wand and you can just, you can just wave it and something's going to happen. What, what would you like to happen? Right, essentially there's a number of problems, number of issues, and it might seem, this might seem weird because to be why so big. But we've had a situation when two journalists are serving sentence, uh, some are on sick leave. And right now, uh, yeah, there's a lot of sick leaves going on. People fall ill quite, quite a lot. Plus, additionally, our status is dubious. Well, by, by dubious status, I mean, we do not have the status of the media, of a media outlet. And we don't risk, uh, we don't... Uh, uh, let our people out, uh, our staff out to rallies uh, where they're supposed to have an accreditation uh, credentials. Uh, so yeah, there is there is a issue with manpower. There's uh, fewer people than needed. Uh, people are tired. Our HR department is helping us again, possibly compared to other colleagues. We are more or less well off, if I, if, I, if I can use this expression, because Studby Y is a large company. We have an HR department that, uh, that is there to help. Uh, they work uh, with lawyers, they, they work to find lawyers, they work to find psychologists if help is needed. I know that uh, our guys uh, turn for such help and it's very efficient. Warm, warm words uh, about the concerts uh, that were held to support the journalists. It's, it's a way to relax. It's a way to, to switch the focus. It's uh, use, useful to do that. But in the time of, at the time of pandemic, or in the times of pandemic, on a Saturday where the situation is more or less calm, we'll take a trip to the, to the, to the uh, forest uh, in, the, in the fall. To, Several people are at the office. Uh, we run a Teams uh, early morning meeting uh, often. It's difficult to assess the emotional state of everyone because it's remote, Every, everyone's camera is, is disabled. So it, it appears that uh, there are no uh, hopeless attitudes. Uh, in any event, I say that guys, if you feel that uh, your situation is critical, please feel free to come to the HR department. They, they, will, uh, they will get you a psychologist uh, to help. They will get you psychological help. The Belarusian Association of Journalists is helping with that as well. But all in all, the situation is, well, the so-called where it's kind of people are enthusiastic enthusiastic because they're angry with what's going on and they work with this enthusiasm i'm troubled by by the things that are happening especially say the situation where vadim zamirovsky's equipment was uh, confiscated uh, he served uh, his sentence uh, then we filed an appeal for this uh, district court uh, court's decision. Uh, the appeal was unsuccessful, but the equipment was not returned to him, although the administrative process against him has been exhausted. So these constant threats, uh, they're also there. They're also lingering there. 
So it's not enough for them for, for a person to serve a sentence. Uh, they're also uh, deprived of their equipment for a long time. And he, if he's lucky that equipment is still there, somewhere there intact. If I may, uh, quickly, I will uh, make a, uh, answer this question. Uh, we have a live broadcast that I need to attend to shortly. Uh, several people have fallen ill with COVID. Uh, they have, uh, they have uh, survived this. Uh, they're coming to the office without being afraid of anything. Uh, a month from now, we'll be possibly thinking about sending them to remote offices as well. Uh, the others uh, have been voluntarily forced <laughs> to, to work remotely. We've seen that uh, from March to July, everything is fine-tuned. This is this does not affect our work. As for the psychological climate, yes, everything is bad. Well, well, scratch, scratch that. Uh, everyone is very tired. Everyone is really tired. If uh, in the first month everyone was uh, Rushing to, to get outside, uh, feeling that uh, the victory is imminent, it's, it's, it's going to happen quick. Now the situation is different. A threat, the pressing, uh, no accreditation, is uh, all of that are no reasons for joy. Although I see that the team is sticking up for each other, we don't have too many people, everyone understands everything. And uh, I don't have to force people to go and do their jobs to the solidarity rallies, uh, to the marches. And they understand uh, that this is the way it's supposed to be, because this is this is the kind of uh, journalism that have, they, they have to do, they have to work in now. So our psychological status is above average. The editor's office, I, I would say, this is it. I don't think uh, any one of us uh, has requested uh, psychological assistance. On the other hand, I cannot say that um, this uh, necessity won't arise in the immediate future. Thank you, Pavel. Have a, have a, have a nice broadcast. Uh, yeah, 2 p.m. it was supposed to start, We're running a bit late, but it's it's fine for, 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 live, for, for a live event. Uh, thank you very, very much, dear colleagues. It was a pleasure to see all of you. Thank you, Pavel. Piotr, Viktor? Same question. Okay, I can try to go ahead and say something about this. When Marina mentioned first COVID, then all of these events, and I realized that that's right. We've been operating in this kind of setting for, for about a year. So uh, answering your question step by step. Remote uh, work has been here for quite a while. Uh, the support staff, the accounts, the accounts office, uh, uh, they have been here. Uh, the ad people have been here. Everyone, all the others are working remotely. That's a, that's a good thing because people live next to the workplaces. If, if something were to happen at night or in daytime, well, people can respond to that, uh, uh, cover, cover that as journalists. Psychological help, not yet. Uh, we haven't requested that. Uh, it's been uh, really tough uh, for the past month when there was constant pressure against us. And when there was this first week in a month arrest free that went arrest free for us, I bought ostrich meat. I have a, I have a farmer uh, who, uh, who breeds ostriches and that's, that's a great, uh, great kind of meat. Uh, we, we did a shashlik uh, ostrich meat. And we, well, we're happy to celebrate. So we're trying to recall that, we're trying to support each other and uh, ourselves internally. A huge role in the microclimate, I would like to say separately. A huge role is uh, overall moods and overall support uh, in the team, on the team. I'm very happy and I'm very proud about all the, I'm very proud for all the guys, for example, our editor-in-chief, Anna, and her husband, Denise, they were arrested twice. Uh, they uh, were, were detained and they came back the same day and got back to work. As Marina has said, uh, they're uh, enthusiastic with the anger or because of the anger. It's, it's a bit different in our case. It's uh, mood. Uh, we're doing our job. We're doing what we must. This is, this is our mood. 
so this is us understanding that this is our duty this this is something that must be done if you're no longer capable well you can just leave if you're there manning your station well go ahead and do your job so come what may we're going to keep doing that unfortunately there have been losses as well in our ranks uh, the video department we've lost pretty much all the video crew we had a very serious team doing the videos for us they used to work at the first city channel as anyhow all of them left so the tough thing for the editor's office everything that journalists can do is just to uh, well read out uh, the statement and uh, do a video uh, untrained people are doing that uh, video uh, shooting these videos we're trying to replace uh, the people who lost the video crew it's it's challenging at the time because people are sc scared people are a bit scared so the summary uh, the people who were prepared to hold on they hold on they do they do it the team can withstand pretty much everything if there is support but uh, well there's uh, there's no way we can uh, anyone can can get through this without losses without taking taking losses my turn right if, if the time permits yes of course the Brezka Gazeta editor's office uh, is in celebratory moods although it may get ruined at any time at any point in time you, you know full well who by whom well, uh, celebratory because we're going to celebrate our 18th anniversary soon. Uh, so we're thinking about how to celebrate it in our today's situation. And speaking seriously, I would like to highlight uh, journalist solidarity. It was perfectly displayed in Brest. If before these events, uh, well, we knew each other. Yes, we said hello to each other. However, uh, we were competitive uh, to an extent. Now we have this pool of friends of like-minded people i've shown you the full i have shown you uh, the pages the the full spread page uh solidarity among journalists we featured other journalists other editions journalists uh, we have telegram communities uh, chats uh, where we exchange everything courts against us against our colleagues and so on and so forth something that keeps us going if somebody gets imprisoned or if there is a court proceedings against someone uh, the entire crew is there to support them in the courtroom if the person leaves the courtroom everyone everyone is there to meet them if they if they are released from detention again everyone meets them so it's a great thing that uh, in these tough times in these tough times uh, journalists digital solidarity came shining right through as for the editor's office uh, we have not lost rank we've even taken on a few a few new people uh, the financially we cannot afford uh, to fill more positions but there's so much work and work under pressure it's quite tough uh, this tiredness it accumulates it builds up uh, nobody visited therapists uh, we've been helping uh, we've been managing uh, with our internal resources everybody everybody has been coping with it themselves with support uh, from everyone no one's insured against any problems because when one side or one party is limited with some rigid frames or some rigid framework and the other side uh, well the opposing side or the conflicting side has no limits has no limitations all the way to murder they can get away with murders well it's difficult to say how it's going to develop further well so far the mood is uh, yeah we're gonna work we're gonna keep working and we will live to see what comes next uh, sorry i also wanted to mention the journalist solidarity and that it works among colleagues uh, of uh, representing every media out there everyone has gotten together and it's important for us not to just show who's who's uh, cooler which uh, which uh, edition 
rocks more. We've seen support in courtrooms, in the Christian detention center. Показывает то, что происходит. То есть. Also important to show what's going on, to show what's happening. The more photos, the more, the more pictures, the more videos, regardless of who made them, it's important to get it out there to help us show that it doesn't matter that edition or this edition contributed this picture or this video. It's very important to, to preserve these details, uh, to, to let them go down in history. Thank you so much. Immense gratitude. Unfortunately, Marina Koktish uh, never was, was never able to uh, get online with us. Uh, uh, well, there's uh, crazy stuff happening to her edition, to her outlet. Well, the time is out, right? You, you understand what's happening to the Narod Volia newspaper. This is one of the newspapers uh, whose circulation was stopped. Four central newspapers uh, were sanctioned like that. Uh, no more printed copies. Belarusska Komsomolka, Komsomolska Pravda in Belarus, Belgazeta, and Svobodne Novosti Plus. Uh, together with Narodna Volia, uh, they were sanctioned against. And Narodna Volia was the only one who was able to publish uh, the newspaper in Russia and uh, to disseminate it uh, through volunteers. Now there are attempts uh, to stop even that. So our adventures are far from being over. We're prepared to take whatever's uh, coming our way next. Thank you very much indeed to all of us, uh, to all of you, to the speakers, to the attendees uh, for being here with us, for tuning in. I would really like uh, our history to be uh, more positive than it is. I wish that to everyone. Thank you very much for the participation. Thank you. Good luck, success to all of you. Stay strong, hold on. Bye, everyone.